Hi guys, so a couple of weeks ago, I talked about my hand spun yarn stash and wanting to transform this into actual projects. And so last night, I pulled something off the loom. I pulled off this hand woven, hand spun scarf. And so I wanted to tell you a bit about the scarf, but also ask you the question, is it possible to be a maker and a minimalist at the same time? Hi guys, thank you guys so much for being here. I'm Felicia from Sweet Georgia, and this is Taking Back Friday. So for more than a year now, I have been posting videos every week talking about making time to make things. Talking about the things that I've made, talking about the things that we're doing at Sweet Georgia, talking about the things that I'm making for the school of Sweet Georgia, but mostly talking about taking time out of your day and prioritizing the actual making of the things that you're excited and passionate and in love with. And so I've been really trying to do this in my own life and making that time to sit down and make things. And it can be especially difficult uh, because the things that I like to do and the things that I like to make are handwoven things. And the handwoven things are made on these looms in the attic here. And so to get up to the attic sometimes takes a little bit of extra effort and extra 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 motivation. So what I've been doing is trying to get into the habit of going into the attic as soon as I have time, not, you know, after I finish doing the dishes or after I finish doing the cooking or after I finish doing whatever it is, I just go there first and do whatever it is that I want to do on my hand woven piece first before I go off and do other things. If I always wait until, oh, everything's done, and then I have time to sit down, it will actually never happen. So I have to kind of take back that time and just go and do it. And so the result of doing that practice or that habit for the past couple of weeks is that I now actually have a finished hand-woven, hand-spun scarf. So I'm gonna show this to you now. And this is what I basically pulled off the loom last night. You can see I washed it. There's fringe that needs to be trimmed. But basically this is the scarf that came off of the loom. This was four different hand spun yarns. Hand spun, two ply, it's kind of like my default yarn. It ends up being kind of like a DK weight, almost like a light worsted weight. And two ply, all spun from hand painted fiber. Some of the fiber was super wash and had a little bit of bamboo in it. So we have a Panda spinning fiber blend at Sweet Georgia. So some of it was Panda, some of it is Superwash BFL, some of it is just regular BFL. So there's a lot of different fibers in this blend, but there's also a lot of different colors in this blend. And the colors all come from the fact that the fiber was hand painted originally. And then when I spun it, I, with these particular skeins, I didn't spin it Navajo plied. I didn't want a three ply and I didn't want to necessarily keep the colors distinct. What I really wanted to see was more mixing and blending ending in these skeins. So I'm going to show you the skeins as well. So these are the skeins that they were basically woven from. And so you can see there's some two ply here and some of it has orange on orange, some of it has green on green, some of it has purple in it, there's browns in it. There's all sorts of colors. And in this one, this one is slightly more, uh, more dark colors come out of it, more browns, more orange, cranberries. And this one, which is Panda, it's got a lot of lighter greens, just lighter versions of those same kind of autumny colors. So all of those mixed together produce this fabric. So when I put this on the loom, I basically have on my baby wolf loom here, sort of like a dummy warp already set up for a scarf. So it has about 120 ends wide. It's set at 12 ends per inch. And so, you know, 120 ends with this makes approximately 10 inch wide scarf. And so, yeah, I just took these four yarns, wound a warp with it, and then tied on to the dummy warp and then just started weaving. And the weaving took maybe two, two, no. If you were to sit down and do it, you'd probably take like, you could do it in an evening, right? But I spent probably about three or four different sessions coming up here and just weaving a couple inches, a couple inches, maybe a foot, just coming up here and doing it more often and just getting in the habit of coming here whenever I had a few minutes to spare and just throw the shuttle a little bit and advance a little bit. And so by the end of that, we're able to get this. So 
I pulled this off the loom last night and as it was coming off the loom, I thought, oh my gosh, it is so stiff and it's so, it felt a little bit harsh. Um, the weft yarn that I used was actually that, uh, let me grab it for you. So the weft yarn that I used was this color, this kind of like dark brown, plummy, purple sort of color. There are definitely pinks and purples and browns in this particular color. This is a silk noil yarn that I got from Japan from a store called Avril many, many years ago. And so when I put this together with the hand spun, it just disappears, like the entire weft color disappears. And I felt like it just made the hand spun yarn itself show up. Like that's all you really see is the hand spun color. So I love that about this particular combination. It just feels like really true to what those hand spun colors are. If I'd used a lighter color, I feel like it would have made everything obviously lighter. And I like that the darkness of this weft yarn kind of fades into the background so that the colors of the hand spun can come forward. So yeah, I love it. But I pulled it off the loom last night and it was very, very stiff. And I thought, well, you know, sometimes this noily kind of yarn, the silk noil, it's not, it's not like supple and um, um, shiny and drapey in a way. It's kind of cottony in some ways. And so I thought maybe that was making this fabric very stiff and thick feeling. But then I washed it and now it's like drapey. Now it flows. Now it, you know... Now it's nice. So there's lots of things that I could do to make this even more drapey, more slinky. Next time I weave something like this, I could use a twill as opposed to using plain weave. Plain weave makes a firmer fabric. Twill would make a drapier fabric. So maybe I can do that next time. But yeah, as soon as this came off the loom, I immediately thought I need to put another one on. And uh, so my plan was to originally start right away and take even the yarn, the hand spun yarn that I had reserved, that I was thinking about making that Andrea Mowry uh, cowl, that night shift or the other, whatever shift it is, to work, to make that. But instead, I think I'm going to take all that yarn, that purplish, bluish kind of hand spun yarn, and I'm going to make something here. And then <laughs> I, I got the suggestion from Jean in our School of Sweet Georgia. Uh, she saw the hand woven blanket that I made couple weeks ago. And she suggested that, you know, she has enough hand spun to make a hand woven blanket. And then I thought, maybe I have enough hand spun yarn to make a hand woven blanket. Maybe I could do this, but make it super, super, super wide and make a blanket. I might have enough hand spun yarn to do that. And then for weft, I could use the mohair for the weft part of it. So now I just have to weigh this and find out how much yardage, you know, I actually used in here roughly, roughly, because this would also weigh in how much weft yarn was used, but just very roughly figure out how much yardage is in here. And then I could figure out how much yardage I would need to make a blanket and then perhaps tie that onto the other big loom over there. So that is my weaving project, which is, yeah, I love this. I could just make these things all day. Now, the reason why I wanted to talk about this maker versus minimalist idea is because, like I just said, I could make these things all day. I could make scarf after scarf after scarf and they would be fun and I would enjoy them and they would be lovely, but then what? Like, do I keep them? Do I give them away? Do I sell them? What do I do? with these things. And I had told you guys a couple weeks ago about how I have this bin of weaving stuff. I just, I weave things and then I put them in the bin and then they never see the light of day again. <laughs> it sounds terrible and it sounds horrible because I love and I enjoy doing the weaving part of it and I enjoy seeing the colors and how they all come together. But then they go into a bin and I... I, I, some, I don't give them away because I feel like they were my tests and I'm, I don't want to give somebody something that's not exactly perfect. And so they're just like, it's just a bin full of swatches and samples and things like that. And so one part of me has one mind, which is to make things more intentionally, to be more focused about what it is that I want at the end of the day, rather than making a whole bunch of 
things over and over again. And then the other side of this story of being a maker versus a minimalist is that when I showed uh, the pictures of me setting up this warp a couple weeks ago on a video, somebody asked me about the little contraption that I have on the back of the loom to hold the lease sticks. And I'll show them to you now. So the thing that uh, one of our commenters was talking about was these things. What are these things? So these things are basically lease stick holders. And so the idea is that when you prepare a warp and it's going to go onto the loom, you use lease sticks to separate and hold the cross of the warp. And so the cross is basically what determines the yarn order, like which order do the threads come in? You know, this, this, <laughs> yeah, which order do the threads come in? And so you place the cross through these two lee sticks to hold everything in place. And so when I learned how to weave, you know, we don't, we didn't have contraptions like this. We used, you know, masking tape. We used other yarn threaded through the, the lee sticks to make sort of a figure eight to keep the lee sticks separated, but you know, far apart, but not too far apart, not too close together. Like it was just tying these lee sticks together was always just a little bit of a faff. And so I had seen something like this uh, in a video by Laura Fry. It's an interweave video called The Efficient Weaver. And Laura Fry, she's actually from BC. She's a weaver. I had the opportunity to interview her for the podcast uh, a couple years ago, but I've been a big fan and a follower of hers for, for a long time now and reading her blog and how she does her weaving and how she does things very, very efficiently. She's a production weaver. And so I saw these things on her loom and they're called angel wings. Hers are made by another manufacturer that makes these things called angel wings and they have like circles cut out. And then these two bits sit at the end of her loom, at the back of the loom, and then they hold the lee sticks in place. So when I saw this, I was like, that's amazing. That's magical. I need to have those. And, um, but then <laughs> it seemed kind of unnecessary. It seemed very luxurious to have these things. And so for many years, I didn't. And then it popped up again somewhere. Someone else had this version of the lee stick holders. And so I ordered these ones and they came. And so basically you put these, this little, this little no mark notch here. This is what fits on the back of the baby wolf loom. And the cool thing is that you can also put them on the front of the baby wolf loom. So no matter if you're, you know, warping from front to back, or if you warp from back to front, you can put these lee stick holders on either end. And then your lee sticks just go through here. And so there's spaces for four lee sticks. So if you wanted to, you could put multiple warps together and lay them together and then beam your, your loom like that. So I have these things. They're very fancy. I feel very spoiled for having these. And so it just got me thinking a lot about, you know, need versus necessity versus nice to haves and things like that. Um, Maybe in the past month or so, I have stumbled upon a few YouTube videos by another YouTuber. His name is Matt Diavella, and he is a documentary filmmaker who created a film called Minimalism, which you can find on Netflix. And I've been watching a lot of his content and this idea of having less stuff, you know, stripping away, just, you know, working with what you actually need, you know, just making do with less and just finding things that are actually meaningful to your life rather than just having a whole bunch of stuff. And so I, I, I've just been like following a lot of his content. And so it just keeps making me feel really guilty about this attic and the fact that I do have multiple looms to work with, the fact that I do have these fancy lee stick holders, the fact that we do have like lots of yarn up here, yarn to make different things, fabric to make different things, you know, yeah, multiple frame looms. So on one hand, I want to feel really lucky and really blessed and really just full of opportunity, full of possibility with all these tools and materials and everything like that. But at the same time, I don't want to feel suffocated by all of this stuff and the pressure to actually use the stuff, use the fabric, use the yarn, use the equipment, have multiple projects going on all at the same time to make sure that I'm maximizing the usage of all these tools. 
So I'm not entirely sure what the answer is here. And I'm curious to know if you think that this idea of being a maker precludes you from being able to also be a minimalist. And if you were a minimalist maker, what would that even look like? Does that mean that you have no stash? Does that mean that you only buy yarn when you actually need it to complete a project? Does it mean that you only focus on one craft and you don't do spinning and weaving and dyeing and knitting and crochet and all the things? I mean, how would that look? And maybe for you, like if you could only have a handful of essential things, essential tools, essential materials, like things that you just couldn't live without, what would those things be? If you could pare it down and just say, these are the things that I absolutely have to have and everything else is just a nice to have. I'm curious what those things would be. So please, please, please leave me a comment below and let me know what you guys are thinking about this particular topic. This comes up for me again and again and again, and especially near, you know, when the new year starts to creep in, because when the new year starts, I like the feeling of starting fresh, of cleaning things out, cleaning the stash, cleaning the attic, de-stashing, get, getting rid of stuff and starting from a clean slate. So I think about this stuff a lot. <laughs> so please do leave me a comment and let me know what you think about this particular topic. I have very little knitting advent calendar shawl project to show you. I am on day three. I think we are halfway through the month. Oh no, we're more than halfway through the month, but we're halfway through the advent calendar and I'm still knitting day three. So <laughs> it's not worth it to show it to you. Um, but in the meantime, I actually have been doing a ton of knitting and it's because I'm knitting swatches for the upcoming color work module that I'm going to be releasing on uh, the School of Sweet Georgia in 2019. And so I'll just give you a quick little preview of a swatch that I'm so in love with. But this is one of the swatches that I'm doing for the color work course. And it's just a way of showing how three different colors could be worked up in completely different ways to produce completely different effects. Just one of the things that we're going to be talking about in that course. So if you guys are interested at all, please do sign up for our newsletter so that you'll hear about what happens at the School of Sweet Georgia and when things are launched. So yeah, I guess that is it for this week's episode. If you guys like this episode, please hit the like button. And if you want to see more videos like this, please hit subscribe and hit the bell for the notifications. And then you'll be notified when new videos like this go live. And one last thing, if you are at all interested in seeing me and uh, my assistant, Leah, Leah Churchley, she's going to be hanging out with me and we're going to be doing a live stream on Friday today at 11 o'clock. Pacific Standard Time. So if you guys are hanging out on YouTube and you see us, we'll be on at 11 o'clock talking about Advent knitting, answering questions about the School of Sweet Georgia. Just generally, we'll be sitting around here in the attic and knitting. All right, I guess that is it for today, and I will see you guys in the next one. Thanks for watching. Bye!